He's Australia's second longest serving Prime Minister, so when John Howard speaks, people tend to listen. The Warane Lecture is an annual public lecture delivered at the University of New South Wales. This year, the former Prime Minister used the occasion to speak about the current economic and political challenges facing Australia. It's an opportunity to hear opinions and insights on Australia's future from a veteran of our political past. And Australia's Public Affairs Channel brings you John Howard's address now and in full. This is APAC, Channel 648, Australia's Public Affairs Channel. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Honourable Greg Smith, QCMP, Member for Epping, Reverend the Honourable Fred Nile, MLA, Assistant President of the Legislative Council, the Honourable John O. Johnson, the Honourable Justice Jeff Lindsay, SC, Supreme Court, the Honourable Justice Francois Quunk, SC, Supreme Court, Honourable Justice Brian Sully, QC, Monsignor Victor Martinez, the Regional Vicar of Opus Day in Australia and New Zealand, members of the College Council, honorary and academic fellows of the College, university staff, old boys, current residents and friends. The Warane Lecture is the highlight of the College's academic year. The annual lecture is delivered by a person, a person eminent in public or professional life. The aim of the lecture is to contribute to the understanding of important issues and challenges facing society. I'm now going to introduce somebody who needs no introduction to Australians. The Honourable John Winston Howard, OMAC. He served as the 25th Prime Minister of Australia from March 1996 until November 2007. He's Australia's second longest serving Prime Minister. He was a member of the House of Representatives from 1974 to 2007. He served as Treasurer from 1977 to 1983. He was Leader of the Liberal Party and Coalition Opposition from 1985 to 1989. He was elected Prime Minister in 1996 and re-elected three times in 1998, 2001 and 2004. He graduated from the University of Sydney in 1961 with a Bachelor of Laws and practised as a solicitor for 12 years. He's been awarded honorary doctorates from the University of New South Wales, Bond University, Macquarie University and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's a member of the Order of Merit and a companion of the Order of Australia. Amongst many other awards, there's the Centenary Medal for Contribution to Australian Society, the Grand Court and First Class of the Order of the Rising Sun, the Star of the Solomon Islands, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom bestowed by the President of the United States. So it is a great pleasure then to invite Mr. Howard to give us the 2014 Warren Lecture. Well, thank you um, very, very much, uh, Professor Shannon, Professor Fogarty, and uh, I acknowledge also many other distinguished people here tonight, and I want to particularly uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, my former parliamentary colleague, Greg Smith. Uh, we shared common territory until the uh, electors of Benelong told me to go to other pastors, and... And uh, can I say that I thought Greg Smith was an outstanding Attorney General for New South Wales. And, uh, I understand something of the ups and downs of politics and the uh, decisions that uh, heads of government are required to make, but uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to record my respect for the work that he did and the sense of balance that he brought to that portfolio. And balance is something that I want to focus on tonight. And I say that I've, I've had the advantage of um, getting to know a little of the audience, having had dinner uh, with a large number of the student body. And you can never, as a politician or a former politician, 
um, feel that you have fully conquered the art of understanding your audience. I've often told the story of my experience after I'd left politics and I went to the presidential library of the 41st president of the United States, George H.W. Bush in College Station in Texas. And he's a gracious man and he and his wife assembled this wonderful gathering of very sound people. I felt as though I was at a Liberal Party fundraiser in Kalara. <laughs> I felt very, very welcome and very much at home and I made a little speech in front of this audience and uh, they cheered everything I said and then the man got up and said to me, uh, you know, we Texans admire what you've done here. What are the things you're proud of? And I said, oh, well, I balanced the budget. Cheers for that. Uh, I, uh, stood we stood beside America in the fight against terrorism. Cheers for that. We brought in changes to the industrial relations system. Cheers for that. And we brought in national gun control laws. Jeanette said to me afterwards, I thought after all those years you'd really, you know, would have learnt. But, uh, <laughs> but I should tell you, after I made that comment, quite a number of the uh, ladies present came up to me very quietly and said, we agree with you and we wish something could be done. And for a nation that I admire enormously, and I do admire a great deal about the United States, so I admire its uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, I admire the, uh, the uh, proper acknowledgement of the role of uh, religious faith in, in public and private life in the United States, but uh, I despair sometimes about their capacity to challenge some of their social problems, and uh, I often contemplate what the likelihood of unexpected death would be for a black person living in the suburbs, say, of a big city like Chicago, where the level of uh, death, the death rate from, uh, from the use of guns uh, is enormous. During uh, the time that I've been out of politics, I am asked to make speeches and give talks and uh, sometimes to share my views on the future uh, and also to reflect about the past. And I'm often asked, uh, uh, what are the qualities that you think uh, define and make a political leader. And many of the things that define and make a political leader are, of course, the qualities that define and make uh, a leader in other areas of life. Uh, a leader in academia, uh, a leader in business, a leader in the military, a leader in the church, uh, a leader in uh, a non-profit organisation. And there are some common uh, leadership qualities. There are, of course, some qualities required for leadership in politics uh, that are not directly relevant. But I think the one that um, always is at the top of my list uh, is that you've got to have a clear and unambiguous set of attitudes and values. The really successful politicians of either side are those that have been clearly identified as having strong values and strong attitudes. Over the years there were many uh, uncomplimentary things that were said about me uh, to my face by my political opponents, perhaps behind my back by others, but that is the nature of public life and I accepted that part of the rough and tumble. But I always got a perverse uh, delight when I heard somebody say or Somebody was quoted as having said, I can't stand John Howard, but at least I know what he stands for. And uh, to me that was um, a sign uh, of approval and it told a story that knowing what you stand for and transmitting that and communicating that uh, is fundamentally important to political success. And I dare say it's fundamentally important to success in any other walk of life. Of course, there are many other things that make a, an effective political leader. One of them, perversely, is a recognition, and it's sometimes hard for people in politics to grasp 
and that is that from time to time you're going to make mistakes and you don't get everything right. And anybody in political life or indeed business life or any other walk of life who believes that you can get every single decision absolutely right uh, is sadly mistaken. I often think of my great political hero, Winston Churchill, who in my view is the towering political figure of the 20th century. Gee, Winston Churchill got a lot of things wrong. Uh, a lot of people were critical of some of his strategic views about the Dardanelles campaign that was so very important to Australia way back in 1915. His decision to, um, in relation to the gold standard when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer was pretty misguided. He supported Edward VIII in the abdication crisis. He was opposed to Indian independence in the 1930s. Although I have to say he did strongly support Home Rule for Ireland. And uh, uh, that is uh, something to his credit for, you know, it might be noted by some of the people present in this audience. Uh, but um, the crucial point of that narrative is that the really big things, they were big things, but the even bigger things were his understanding of the growing threat of Nazism and fascism in the 1930s. And if his advice had been followed in the 1930s, uh, the horrors of World War II and all that was entailed in that might well have been avoided. And of course, the magnificent leadership that he gave uh, to his nation and to the world during those difficult days uh, stamp him, in my opinion, as the towering political figure of the 20th century. Now the point um, I want to make though is that just as a successful leader is somebody who stands for something and also knows his or her own limitations, a successful nation and a nation that tackles its future successfully is one that understands not only what it believes in, but where it came for, came from, and where it wants to go. And one of the things that troubles me about Australia in 2014 is not so much some of the economic challenges, and there are, and they'll be debated ad nauseum uh, over the next couple of weeks, and I think I shall refrain tonight uh, from adding to the store of debate or the store of knowledge on that except to say that just as an individual must live within his or own means, then so a nation must live within its means. But I worry that sometimes uh, in our haste to conform to a contemporary, of notion, contemporary notions of what the reaction of our country should be to a changing world, that we lose sight of the influences that have shaped us and we lose sight of where we have come from. Some of you may be aware that 18 months ago I delivered a lecture in memory of Sir Paul Hasluck, the former Governor General of Australia, in which I lamented uh, decisions that have been taken by the various education ministers of Australia about the teaching of Australian history. I'm sorry to say that 18 months on, nothing much has changed. Although there is under review at present the curriculum being chaired by a Dr. Kevin Donnelly and comprising a number of other respected academics, the reality is that save and accept a few changes that were made in response to expressions of concern, that history curriculum, that national history curriculum has been adopted throughout Australia, including here in the state of New South Wales, by a coalition government. And it contains, in my view, a distorted and dispiriting and dismaying view of Australian history. To put that in context, we have to understand a number of fundamentals about this country. This country is a projection of Western civilization. We may be geographically located in the Asia-Pacific region, and that is to our enormous, enormous economic advantage. And that was demonstrated by the fact that we were able to sail through 
the global financial crisis relatively unaffected because of the enormous demand for the resources that Providence has given us by China most particularly and Japan and Korea as well. But it doesn't alter the fact that we are culturally, historically, spiritually and in every other way a Western nation. One's culture is not defined by ethnicity, one's culture is defined by one's history and one's experience and by one's values. And one of the things that I find uh, depressing about the history curriculum is the extent to which the influences of Western civilization have been marginalized. The way in which the Judeo-Christian ethic, which has formed the moral wellspring of this country ever since its formation, has been effectively airbrushed from a proper understanding of this country's history. And the influence of British institutions on Australian life have been virtually obliterated from a proper study uh, of history. And I say that very directly. You can't understand the Australian story unless you understand the British story. And that is not some old-fashioned, psychophantic, empire loyalist view. It's a statement of fact. We speak the English language. We live according to what is, could be loosely be called Anglo-Australian law. The great institutions of this country, the parliament, the free press, the relatively civil political discourse, sometimes it doesn't seem too civil, <coughs> but compared with what happens in many other countries, it's extremely civil. All of those are inheritances uh, of our British legacy and our British background. And one of the great virtues of Australia is that we have been able to take from our past the good things, but discard from our past many of the bad things. We didn't transplant from the United Kingdom class snobbery and divisions, nor many of the other rigid elements of British society, but rather we have taken uh, the good bits. We've even learnt to play their sport a great deal better than what they have been able to carry, but uh, you'll forgive that uh, uh, a little bit of uh, triumphalism. So part of the great Australian achievement has been our capacity to take the good pieces of our inheritance and reject the bad bits. But the other great thing about the Australian achievement is what I call a sense of balance. And I mentioned that at the beginning of my remarks. We have been better in achieving a balance in our society in so many important areas than have most other countries. Let me take a simple area such as health and another area such as education. I know there are many people in this audience who know a great deal more about the Australian health system than I do. But I know enough about it to recognise that with all its flaws and weaknesses, it's an infinitely better health system than operates in any comparable country in the world. And one of the reasons that it is effective in my view is that we have preserved a balance between the public and the private. And each complements the other, and the one couldn't operate without the other. We don't have the endless debates that occur in many other countries about whether something should be more privatised or more dominated by the public sector. The same, I think, can be said about education. In Australia, we now have something in the order of 34% of students throughout Australia are now educated in non-government schools. That is not to deny the fundamental importance of having a strong public education system to underpin <coughs> the generality of our education system. And one of the remarkably praiseworthy elements of Australia's education system is that the provision of public education in the poorer areas of our country, particularly in our cities, 
is far better and of a higher quality and a higher standard than the provision of public education in the poorer areas and inner city areas of countries such as the United States. But what we have been able to do in this area once again is to preserve a sense of balance and a proper understanding that both the public and the private can make a contribution. And as a consequence, uh, we are able, despite many of the shortcomings that our system has, we are able to boast a, a level and an extent of personal freedom of choice in this country uh, which amazes uh, many other countries with which we normally compare ourselves. The other great area in which I believe Australia has achieved a great sense of balance is in our politics. Now that may sound self-serving from somebody who was part of the Australian political system for more than 30 years. But one of the things that always struck me about Australian politics when I was in it and it continues to impress me now that I'm out of it is that Australians deep down don't like fanatics, they don't like extremists and in the end they will reject them whether they are extremists of the left or they're extremists of the right, they will reject them. We are a wake up, we're cynical towards people who are too fanatical and too zealous and too extreme. It's, I suppose, part of our Celtic scepticism which gives us that quality and it's a very commendable quality. And we have a far greater capacity to suss out people who are extremists than is the case with many other people. Now, if you bring all of this together, you are able to detect a pattern of a nation which not only has kept the best of its inheritance, but also a nation in relation to its own practices and its own institutions, has been able to develop further a sense of balance and has a capacity in relation to that of rejecting the extreme fringes uh, and rejecting fanaticism. And it's for, for these reasons particularly I may return to the inadequacies of the new history curriculum, but I find it very disturbing that at a senior level in our high schools, whether they're public or private, if you take a history course, a full understanding of the massive achievement of Federation is not a compulsory study. One of the extraordinary things I discovered about the curriculum was that one of the options in the senior years is to study three aspects of globalisation since 1945. Now that sounds terrific and relevant on the surface and the three options given are one, popular culture, number two, environmental movements and three, mass migration. Now mass migration obviously has been an important part of the world story since 1945. Uh, I'm sure environmental movements are important. Popular culture, well, yes. <coughs> <coughs> but I would have thought, <coughs> excuse me, the most important development, if you're looking at globalisation, that's occurred uh, since 1945 has been economic globalisation. If you are looking for the reason why in the last 30 years hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, you would have to say that that is a consequence of economic globalisation. It's a consequence of the beneficial operation of competitive capitalism and free markets particularly in Asia, which have lifted so many people out of poverty. And I find it quite extraordinary that, with due respects to both a talented entertainer uh, and uh, a talented um, group, I find it extraordinary that um, our, uh, the designers of our curriculum 
should make the judgment that a study of, say, Kylie Minogue or ACDC is more important than a study of economic globalisation. I also find it uh, disturbing that in looking at the political developments that have occurred around the world since 1945, there is no direct opportunity to discover and learn about the most significant political development since the end of World War II, and that is the collapse of Soviet imperialism and Soviet communism. The rise and fall of Soviet communism is the great rise and fall story, in a sense, uh, of the entire 20th century. And the contribution that was made towards the final internment of Soviet communism by Pope John Paul II, by Margaret Thatcher and by Ronald Reagan, each of them in their inimitable way contributing enormously to the moral the military and political undermining of the Soviet edifice uh, represents to me the, the area of history since World War II that warrants uh, uh, the greatest uh, and most intensive study. But perhaps worst of all is that the curriculum as currently devised does not require those studying history to do a detailed study of the history of our country between the late 18th century, the time of British settlement, through to 1914, the commencement of World War I. And as a consequence of that, the remarkable achievement of federation uh, is, is not something that is a mandatory part of the course. Federation was a remarkable achievement for this country. For all its faults, the federal system in Australia is superior to the federal system in the United States or India or Nigeria or Canada or other countries that have federal systems. Uh, many Australians are not aware that women had the full vote years ahead of their conferees in either Britain or the United States. And Australia was a trailblazer in giving women the vote. Many people are, are unaware that the secret ballot was developed in this country and the federation arrangements that put in place a balance between the federal and state governments, although it continues to be a source of vigorous debate, uh, even, until, even under 2014, they were better arrangements and they were a better balance. And I sometimes wonder why we are so shy as a nation in extolling the wisdom of our founding fathers and... Uh, they were at that time all fathers um, uh, because of the, the nature of the political structure, the wisdom of our founding fathers, uh, that we are not uh, as proud of what they were able to achieve. Now, ladies and gentlemen, therefore, when I think of the future of this country, of course one has to think of the economic future. Can I say, uh, in, the, in the main, I remain a tremendous optimist about... Australia's economic future. We're very fortunate, as I said earlier, Providence gave us all of those resources. I think we've gone to sleep a bit on the reform process over the last little while. I think we have to pick up the ball on reform again because we did a lot in that area with contributions from both sides of politics in the 1980s and the early 1990s. But fundamentally, we ought to be optimistic about our longer term future. I would just, however, enter a word of caution about people who become a little too mesmerised about the future of China. China is remarkably valuable to Australia because it's an enormous country. It has an almost voracious demand for our resources. It's been a very good purchaser and we have been a very reliable supplier. But China faces two great challenges. One of them is an ageing population because of the one child policy and although the consequences of that in the very short term are being overcome by the continued migration of people from rural and poorer areas of the country into the city 
and the industrial areas, uh, that process will ultimately uh, reach its finality and as a result China will face the challenge that no country will ever want and that of, of becoming old before the country has become rich because although in aggregate terms uh, China has a large economy on a per capita GDP basis, which is the proper measure of living standards in any society, China's living standard is still well below. The point I, obvious, I make is that we should be wary of predicting endless, seamless, continually expanding economic growth in a country that will have that demographic challenge. And of course, like all countries that have transformed their economies, ultimately those who grow up in China taking relative affluence for granted are going to demand control over their political future. If you have gone from poverty to wealth in your lifetime, you might put up with being told how to run your life politically, but your children, you can be certain, won't, because they will start with the assumption of relative affluence. My friends, uh, I welcome the opportunity of sharing some thoughts with you tonight I speak, as I mentioned a moment ago, as a tremendous optimist about the future of our country, but I worry that that great sense of balance that we've had over the years, and I worry about many of the achievements and the influences that have shaped this country, most particularly the fact that we're part of Western civilization and the influence of the Judeo-Christian ethic that they are under challenge uh, in contemporary society. Many things that most of us in this audience would have taken for granted as being the underpinning of what defines this country uh, are under challenge. And I was particularly struck by a speech delivered by a former justice of the High Court, Dyson Hayden, several weeks ago, when he spoke of attempts that are being made by many to marginalise the influence of the Christian religion in the public space in the name of secularism. As I've always understood it, there's no difficulty for the people of Christian belief in accepting that this is a secular society in the context of uh, Christ's exhortation, uh, exhortation rather, in the Gospel of St Matthew when he spoke of those things Caesar's being rendered unto Caesar and those things that belong to God being rendered unto God. So from the very beginning there was an acceptance that uh, there were things that belonged uh, to the state and there were things that belonged uh, to the individual and to the personal spirit and uh, there's no difficulty in accepting that. But in more contemporary times attempts have been made in the name of Australia being a secular country uh, not to just accept that balance, but rather to marginalise and to uh, indicate as uh, some kind of an aberration the influence of religion within our community. Now these are issues that go beyond the normal parameters of economic and political debate because they go to the character of the nation we are, they go to a proper understanding of our history, and they're also fortunately uh, issues that can transcend the political divide uh, because these are issues that ought to be of concern and interest to men and women in this country irrespective of their political beliefs. Can I finally say, my friends, thank you very much for inviting me here. I find this is my first visit to this college. Um, I had many family members that attended this university. In fact, the majority of the members of my immediate family attended this university. And uh, I've, uh, I've heard many good things about the college, but I really feel quite privileged to have been invited here tonight and to remark upon the tremendous good humor uh, and uh, optimism uh, and sense of uh, involvement that was evident at the dinner tonight. You seem to me to have a magnificent resident student body and I can understand the continuing enthusiasm of so many of you who were previously residents of this college. Thank you very much.
Mr Howard has indicated that he's happy to entertain questions. I won't moderate them. He'll, he's much more experienced in handling questioners than I am. So, is there a question? You can't interject, Fred, either. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Howard, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, you talked about the importance of institutions, and I was wondering if you could please talk a bit about the future of the institution of marriage, and in particular, I guess, a couple of the, couple of the, um, a couple of the challenges at the moment with the high divorce rate and potentially the, the, the redefining of it to include same-sex couples. So could you please uh, address, I guess, what you think the future of marriage is in this country? And well, the yeah, I, I think marriage is the bedrock social institution of this country. Uh, it has been, and uh, it's important to society uh, that it continue to be. Uh, the reason why I uh, support the traditional understanding of marriage is that overwhelmingly the evidence suggests that the best environment in which to raise children in uh, a stable uh, fashion and uh, with the best prospects for success in future life is in uh, a marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, my support for that is not an expression of hostility to other lifestyles. It's an expression of a positive view about the benefits of what may be called a traditional approach to marriage. I think one of the problems with this whole debate is the capture of the language uh, by those who want change. Um, and uh, I think... Uh, the attempts being made to brand every person who has a position like I have uh, as uh, hostile to uh, gay people, as homophobic, I find that um, absurd uh, and it's something that people should be a little more resentful of and uh, because it is. And um, the, the, the re this is not a, an issue of, this has got nothing to do in my view with discrimination, it's got to do with what is the, on balance, the better, the more likely outcome that produces the best result for children. Now, I think everybody agrees that the aim should be to have children raised in an environment uh, which is uh, more likely to produce the better outcome. Now, that's not to say that children can't be raised in a loving environment that's not a traditional family. I accept that. But in, in these, in designing social policies, you have to look at the aggregate evidence and the aggregate evidence from all of the surveys indicate very strongly that that's the situation. <laughs> Jono. <Don't know. laughs> mm. Could I offer my profound congratulations for your stand taken from the captain's call of the, who held the position of the present Prime Minister on imperial honours. Congratulations. <laughs> In my position, yes. Yes. Thank you. Sussex Street Emeritus. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, I do think uh, a law such as the one that we're dealing with uh, is, uh, has gone too far. Now, how it finally settles down, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I broadly share the views that have been expressed by Tony Abbott uh, and Brandis and others, uh, but just exactly what language you use is another matter. I was wondering if you could uh, share your experiences on what it was like to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, uh, Paul Keating. Uh, I think that was one of the most, it was before my time, but probably one of the most entertaining rivalries I've seen in political history. So uh, if you could just ex uh, explain some of your experiences with that, that'd be good. Oh, uh, well, it was, <laughs> it was fairly willing. <laughs> and then I can say uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, I think, I think he, he, had, uh, he had an interest in vigorous debate. Uh, as I did. We, we sometimes agreed on things. Um, I don't think he was quite as strong a constitutional monarchist as I was. But <laughs> uh, and he, uh, he barracked for the bulldogs too. He right? barracked for the dragons. Uh, look, he was, look, he was a, the, the night I won the election against him in 96, um, I, I said that he'd been a great warrior in the Labor Party cause, and he had been. And I understood that, I understood uh, the intensity of his beliefs, and um, I hope that he understood the intensity of mine. And you are conditioned by your upbringing, it was, uh, and uh, his upbringing had been a bit different, although, interestingly enough, his father had had a small business, as had mine. Uh, well that, and, but uh, his in family influences were Labor, mine were I can assure you, overwhelmingly uh, orthodox liberal uh, of the late 1940s, early 1950s variety. But uh, I bear him absolutely no animosity of any kind. Uh, he uh, fought for what he believed in, still does. And uh, I wish him well on a personal basis. Why not? <laughs> Life's too short to carry too many hatreds. Um, I graduated from high school in 2008, uh, so I was raised under your government, um, essentially. I don't remember an earlier Prime Minister than you. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you didn't miss a lot in many cases. <laughs> um, Mr. Howard, um, when I graduated, I'm sorry to say, and I think actually a lot of the... Uh, graduates here who um, finished school recently will agree with me as well. I graduated with a, almost a hatred of Australian history, unfortunately. Um, but I'm saying this because I, uh, post school, I went on to study um, history and arts, and I graduated from that with honours in Australian history. Um, so right now I'm, st I'm studying to become an educator, a history teacher, postgraduate at UNSW. And, um, and uh, I'm afraid you, I think I've, you've been a little bit unfair with the curriculum. Um, but um, my understanding of the Australian, curric uh, the Australian history curriculum is that Australian history is taught throughout stages one, two, and three, with uh, stages four and five being from year seven onwards, opportunities in both of those for the teaching of Australian history. But like you said, there's no emphasis on it in um, stages four and five. I'll agree with you there. But the focus more in these, later, in these later stages are on historical skills. So my question is, surely it's more important to teach this sort of uh, inquisitive thinking than um, so that people can form a, their own love of Australian history, just as I did after school. Can I get your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are that unless you understand uh, what happened, you know what happened, you can't uh, apply any analytical skills to it. I mean, the weakness of what I might loosely call the modern approach to the teaching of history is that it focuses on issues uh, rather than on things that happen. Now, you can argue that history has got to be more than a recitation of dates and uh, the chronological sequence of events, and I accept that. But um, so often uh, the teaching of history now devolves into 
uh, the study of the rights and wrongs of individual issues in, in relation to individual issues without a proper understanding of what actually occurred. I mean, I've looked at the curriculum in relation to human rights. Now, the starting point appears to be the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Now, in my view, that's not the starting point of human rights. Uh, I would have thought uh, the illustrations of um, you know, the blows struck for human rights, the abolition of slavery. And I can't think of anything in human history that uh, on a continuing basis which is in a greater denial of human rights than slavery. And I would have thought that the uh, efforts of uh, people like Wilberforce and others to abolish slavery is, uh, uh, should be a central core. Now, I'm not saying it's un not mentioned, but the way the curriculum has been written and the way I read the curriculum is that the real starting point is that oh, well, the United Nations has this charter. Now, that's fine, but charters alone don't do anything. The Soviet Union's constitution had a fine charter uh, about uh, liberties. The constitution of the Weimar Republic in Germany had an eloquent statement of racial equality. Uh, and in the end, uh, it's the deeds of, of men and women uh, who've done more and, and the contribution that they've made. So I find the, um, the way in which in history is presented um, and the, the lack of focus on events. I mean, you cannot understand fully um, the causes of a great world movements without understanding the sequence of events. You've got to be taught the order in which events occurred. You can't understand the Russian Revolution uh, without uh, understanding the impact of, the, of a number of things that went before it, such as the, the war with Japan, such as the, the whole uh, czarist structure in, in, in Russia, the impact of participation in World War I uh, on Imperial Russia. Uh, I would argue that there is, there is insufficient discussion on those things, and I quoted the examples of you know, the great movements since World War II. Well, I mean, it is patently absurd to have a curriculum about globalisation since 1945 that doesn't do with economic globalisation. Uh, and it's the fundamental achievement of globalisation. It's the thing that's lifted people out of poverty. Uh, when they write the economic history of the last 30 years, uh, they will not recall the global financial crisis as having been the most important development, uh, but rather uh, the way in which uh, globalisation has lifted so many people out of poverty. Now, I'm not arguing against um, uh, analytical inquiry, far from it, but you can't have a, a proper analytical inquiry unless you understand the foundation of the circumstances to which that inquiry is directed. And uh, I don't think you can understand our democratic system without understanding how it has evolved. I mean, I keep reading in the paper how uh, the, the terrible turmoil that people are having in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in establishing a democracy, and people are saying it's a terrible failure because uh, there are bombs going off and people being murdered. Yeah, that's true. But you have to look back into our history when I say our history, I mean going right back to British history. That's where our system came from, that the, the difficulties and the travails through which our civilization passed before we developed this still imperfect model, uh, but a model which is uh, relatively civil and relatively peaceful. And I think we should be a little more humble uh, than uh, sort of jump to ready criticism of what is being attempted. I mean, you, you have a turnout in that recent Iraqi election which exceeded the turnout in the last presidential election in the United States, and they had to do that through a threat of terrorism and bombing and intimidation and the like. Sure, there's a lot of corruption, sure, uh, and, and I don't find any of that acceptable, but there is a lot of corruption in, in, in European processes hundreds of years ago in, in all areas of society. 
Uh, we all are aware of that. Um, so you, in my view, you have to have a, a greater un factual understanding of what happened. I mean, you can't understand history without uh, some sequential um, knowledge of, of, of what happened and when and what caused which event. And when you've got that proper base, you can then uh, bring the analytical focus to bear. And the problem with just starting with the analytical focus is that it becomes a, uh, a, you know, an ideological argument rather than an argument based on uh, historical knowledge and inquiry. You know, that's, you know, I don't think we're all that far apart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. Good evening, Mr. Howard. Thank you for your remarks so far tonight. Mr. Howard, recently you mentioned in an interview that the most important thing in your life was becoming a parent and raising three children, mm. a task no doubt very difficult for someone practicing politics at the highest level, no doubt hard for anyone. My question is, how did you achieve the balance of remaining an active and involved parent while leading a nation? Well, I... Um start off by saying that, that politics is not the only profession that places demands on people who are also parents. Uh, it's very important that other jobs take fathers and mothers away in the normal course of events from their home during the week and I think it's sometimes a danger that politicians fall into believing they're the only people who have to cope with this. There's a lot of, I think of all the people I've known in the Navy uh, who were away for long periods of time. Look, I, I was very fortunate. Um, I married somebody who was not only very supportive of my uh, career aspirations in politics, but somebody who has a continuing interest in politics herself. Uh, my wife has a standalone uh, interest. I don't mean that we argue all the time about <laughs> politics, but... We often agree, but we sometimes disagree on issues of that. I mean, we're on the bro same broad side, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the truth is that um, uh, Jeanette's always been very interested in politics, and she was a, a wonderful uh, uh, mother, it remains so. And uh, I think what, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but I think what really matters is that if you've got a busy life, other life, when you're not living out that other life, you have to make sure that your children understand when you are with them, they're the only people that matter. And, and giving children a love and security, and different people find different ways of doing that, but giving children love and security and the sense that they are the most important people in your life, uh, that uh, uh, is what we tried to do and uh, touch wood. Uh, mind you, our, our children are well into their 30s now, and, uh, uh, but we were very fortunate and uh, public life imposes a lot of strain on families and there are no doubt strains imposed on my children at, uh, at university and one of them still in the last couple of years at school when I became Prime Minister, I accept all of that. But they um, uh, displayed tremendous uh, loyalty and affection and support uh, and I'll ever be grateful to uh, them and to my wife for the tremendous support and understanding they extended to me. Mr. Abbott introduces a deficit tax in next week's budget. <laughs> well, I don't know what is in the budget. I don't. Mr. Abbott is a very close friend of mine, but He's the Prime Minister now, and as he has frequently said, this is the first term of the Abbott government, not the fifth term of the Howard government. <laughs> and and um, he's running the show now, and I'll, uh, I have enormous affection for Mr Abbott, and I think he'll do a, a tremendous job as Prime Minister, but I don't think I want to speculate about what is in the budget. Uh, I really don't, uh, because um, there has been a lot of speculation, a great deal of speculation and uh, uh, I um, would rather 
decline the invitation to speculate about the speculation. <laughs> if I can do that. Mm. Mm. Well, I can take you back to possibly looking into the future. Yeah. Could, um, could you uh, give us your thoughts on where you see manufacturing going in this country? Um, as I see it, we're losing capacity, and is that something that we could regret sometime in the future? Well, I think that the 1960s and 70s view of manufacturing in this country has gone for good. That doesn't mean to say that manufacturing in Australia has gone for good, uh, and I'll come to some examples that give me a lot of hope but just as the end of um, the textile, clothing and footwear industry as a major employer in Australia was inevitable, so it was inevitable that without an unacceptable level of government support that the motor manufacturing industry was going to end. And I, I have been surprised at the relative acceptance of that by the Australian public. I think it's fair to say that the decision that the government took early in its term not to provide further help to the manufacturing, motor manufacturers, uh, that has been quite widely accepted, more so than I anticipated would be the case. Inevitably, we'll move into a greater emphasis on service industries, and that is no bad thing. We shouldn't denigrate service industries. Uh, the Chinese love our educational facilities. Uh, we have very high quality health services in this country and many of them could be exported to parts of Asia. There are some standout performance. I, I'm sure they won't object, object to the sort of commercials, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a very successful Australian company called Zip Heaters, uh, which uh, uh, manufactures and exports all around the world uh, uh, heating systems gone to all around the world. Last year I was in Shanghai and I, uh, I opened um, a Chinese franchise for a bed manufacturer which has been operating in the inner, in the inner southwestern suburbs of Sydney since for about 90 years, a family company and it's been a very successful one and it's exporting uh, manufacturing beds in Australia and selling them into China and the, the, you would be amazed at the prices that some of the newly enriched middle class of China are willing to pay for new Australian beds. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very interesting little story. Yeah, it's, a cha it's changing and, 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 and what is what they welcome is the particular skills. And I went to this company's factory. They have this wonderful staff. Most of them have been there for 15 or 20 years. And typically, as you know, if you treat staff well and you pay them well and you talk to them and, and make them part of the family of the firm, they stay and they're loyal. And they're the, that's the best possible lesson in industrial relations that you can have. Uh, and and uh, the skill of these people is, is amazing. Now, they're only two little stories, but the other thing to remember is that the process of, of jobs leaving an industry shifting around is now occurring in Asia. Jobs are being lost in parts of China and Taiwan to countries like Bangladesh because the wage levels in Bangladesh are lower than what they are. I mean, I deplorably low and obviously the, they have terrible uh, safety standards in Bangladesh just as there are some very bad safety standards in mines in a China. I wouldn't like to be a, uh, a Chinese miner. Uh, it, it's a pretty hazardous oper operation. But this is happening and you have to recognise that just as jobs go, but in the end domestic costs are very important. And a good illustration of this is the way in which some manufacturing jobs are now returning to the United States from parts of Asia because the way in which the Americans have used shale 
to produce oil and gas and to lessen for the rest of the world, including in time Australia. The way in which they've done that, they've reduced their energy costs and energy costs are a major component of manufacturing costs. And as a result of that, some jobs that uh, left America and went to China are now coming back. And it's an object reminder that you've got to have your cost structure. And however you do it, it's not just wages. And right at the moment, wages in Australia are not rising at a rapid rate. Uh, if you look at the figures, uh, wages in Australia are quite contained. But uh, uh, there are other elements of, uh, that bear upon the cost of employing people, it's not just a straight wage, but domestic costs are tremendously important to the competitiveness of any industry. Conscious of the time, Justice Cook has had his hand up a few times, so that will be the last question. Mr Howard, I want to move the perspective to the international. Um, you mentioned that in your opinion the rise and fall of Soviet communism was the great historical narrative of the 20th century. The collapse of a system like that has far-reaching consequences and it seems at the moment we are seeing the working out of some of those consequences in the Ukraine. My question is what do you perceive of the current situation in Russia and how should the West respond to what's happening in the Ukraine? I'd start by saying that one can draw a straight line from the Tsars um, through to Vladimir Putin. Straight line. There used to be a, an expression that the Tsar of Russia was called the Tsar of all the Russians and I, I sort of think of that expression when I think of Vladimir Putin. Uh, there is a straight line and, and there's, it's it, it, the Russian expansionism is underpinning what he's doing. What will happen in the Ukraine? I think Russia is trying bit by bit to gobble the place up. Uh, I think we have to understand the historical parallels but not overdo them. People have autom many people have automatically said, well, what he did with Crimea was similar to what the, uh, Hitler did with the Sudetenland area of Czechoslovakia. Now, that's, I mean, there's, a, there's a theoretical historical comparison, but I don't think the circumstances are the same. I don't think uh, Putin is wanting to have a war and wanting to um, uh, gobble up a large number of countries in Eastern Europe, but there's no doubt in the world that what he is doing is popular in Russia. No doubt in the world, and that's one of the reasons why he's doing it. Um, and uh, what? how can the West react? Well, it's a very difficult challenge for the West. Uh, there's no stomach for any kind of military action, and I, I don't think there should be. Uh, there's certainly no stomach in the United States for military action. I do think the relatively passive posture that the Americans have adopted in the last few years has probably emboldened Putin to believe uh, that he could get away with it. Uh, I think they'll continue to put pressure on those parts of the Ukraine which are pro-Russian and uh, when you see these things happening you think how blessed we are that we're not, we're not a landlocked country. Uh, the whole history of Europe has been uh, neighbouring countries exchanging bits of territory uh, uh, with each other uh, over a long period of time and that is basically what has happened. Uh, with uh, the Ukraine. You've got part of it which is very pro-Russian, you've got part of it which is very pro-European. The situation is, is weakened, in the Western position is weakened by the economic weakness of many European countries. I think the energy policies of some of the European, West European countries have encouraged the Russians to believe they can extract enormous leverage from the gas they supply the rest of Europe. I can't for the life of me understand why the Germans have walked away from nuclear power. Uh, I can't understand why the Germans have uh, adopted energy policies which in the long run are going to be quite damaging to their economy. And their economy up recently has been the strongest in Europe. I'm, I'm puzzled by uh, European energy policies and I think some of them have given the Russians a belief that they can use energy as a lever that perhaps in other circumstances 
they wouldn't have been able to do. So I don't have a clear solution because there isn't one uh, and it requires a, a combination of good diplomacy plus um, more sensible domestic economic policies and certainly more pragmatic, realistic energy policies. I just am amazed at the reaction of so many European countries, particularly Germany, to um, energy policies and energy issues. I know the nuclear disaster in Japan had a big effect on the world, but the French get 70 to 80 percent of their electricity from nuclear power. And uh, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm of the view that nuclear power is part of a long-term uh, energy environmental equation. It's a very clean source of energy. Uh, and uh, every scientific survey I've read indicates that, that you know, coal fire energy or, or, or nuclear to produce base load power, you can't produce base load power from windmills and, uh, and solar. And uh, I just can't understand the approach that some of the European countries have taken, and this applies not only to nuclear power, but also to the extraction of oil and gas from shale, because the potential for that is enormous. So it's, a, it's, it's difficult, but Putin is behaving like Tsar, Lenin, Stalin, uh, the Russian expansionism is no different. You get the front line from Tsar Alexander Nicholas right through to, to Tsar Vladimir.